Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's very nice to see you here, and you're all very welcome to this event, which is on using digital technology to achieve better social outcomes. Um, today, we've got an amazing group of panellists. All, I have to say, are international and national award winners. So I'll, I'll just tell you that at the beginning. I won't go into it afterwards. But um, we have Isolt Ward, Brian Fitzsimon, Sean Moyne, and, and Owen Ryan. Um, and today's talk, I think, or, or event, is looking really at how digital technology can impact lives, can change our way of looking at things, and can facilitate development in a way that we haven't thought about. We often hear about technology and its problems. This is a technology that in, ensures better so, social outcomes. So I think it's one of the first times that we've taken this theme and very pleased to see you all here because I know you have a, a particular <coughs> interest in it. I just say the house rules at the beginning, if you could turn off your mobile phones, I'm sure everybody has done that. <laughs> and to say that this session, the, the, you know, the talks are on record, but the, the questions and answers are off record, just to let you know that. So our first speaker today is Isolt Ward. Everybody will speak for just under 10 minutes, and I know they're going to be absolutely perfect speakers and keep to that. Um, and we've got a range here of people looking at different issues uh, in, in the social side. Food poverty, issues around access to education, marginalisation in the education system, and older people living alone and enabling them and the agencies in which they work with to be in part. And also the, the Social Innovation Fund Ireland that helps facilitate these kind of enterprises. So the first theme we're going to look at is uh, food wastage. And I know Isolt will give us a, a, a background on that. But Isolt and her co-founder, Isolt Ward, and her co-founder, Yvonne O'Brien, set this company up in 2013 and in this short period of time is now working in the UK, in Dublin, Cork and Galway and has managed through technology to address a social issue where there is a lot of waste and people needing food and enabled that wastage to become a social asset. So Isolt, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, first I'll tell you a bit about the problem of food waste. Over 30% of all food produced is lost or wasted across the global system, food system. That's almost a trillion dollars in economic losses and 8% uh, and is responsible for 8% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest global uh, greenhouse gas emitter after China and the US. And all of this food is going to waste when almost 800 million people around the world don't actually have enough to eat. Even in Ireland, we're wasting a million tons of food every year, and one in eight people are experiencing food poverty. According to the UN, if we could take just 25% of all of the food that's going to waste, that would be enough to feed all of the people who are malnourished. So, we set up Food Cloud uh, in 2013 as a social enterprise with a vision for a world where no good food would go to waste. We started off with a very simple solution. <coughs> this was our first ever donation where we connected a farmer's market to a local charity. Uh, and this was, I suppose, our first piece of a concept. We didn't even use technology except for uh, a few phone calls. And um, we basically found a farmer's market that at the end of the market on a Wednesday and a Saturday had really uh, perfectly good food that was going to waste. And a local charity, um, Don Bosco Teenage Care, that housed up to 10 um, teenagers who were transferring between foster care. Uh, and they basically ran it like a home, but it was local to the farmer's market. So we connected the two and said, you know, could you benefit from this food and would you be interested in donating it? And what was incredible for us was the impact that we saw beyond what we had anticipated. So 
Of course, they were, the farmer's market was delighted not to have to waste this food that they'd worked so hard to produce and bring to the market. Um, and of course, the charity were delighted to receive uh, some um, free food. But actually, we created an amazing relationship in a local community where all of a sudden, um, a charity and a business are connected and they realise that they have a way to work together which actually solves each other's problems. Um, and beyond that again, what was amazing for the charity was the absolute crazy variety of the food. So you can see on the table there, it's actually raw milk and mm. very artisan breads and all of these like gourmet sausages. So the charity uh, were absolutely delighted because they had all of these teenagers who'd never seen half of these food products before coming down and reading through them and laughing and um, you know swapping the food together. So the community aspect and the bringing people together around food was one of the amazing impacts that we hadn't anticipated and this was actually the first time that we experienced that. So we knew that we wanted to do this at scale but we knew that we'd never be able to facilitate donations amongst every food business and charity in Ireland um, without the use of technology. So we developed a very simple solution that basically um, allows businesses to uh, upload details of their surplus food using a very simple app uh, and a notification is then sent to a charity that's in their local community offering them the food that's available. The charity texts back, confirms and then collects it directly from the food business. What the technology allows us to do um, here is it basically streamlines the communication between the store and the charity and also um, and also allows us to track the impact. So we can tell the businesses how much food they've donated and the impact they're having in their community and also the charities how much they've saved and how much they've been able to expand their impact because of this new supply of food. Um, so that our first retailer to come on board, we were quite lucky, it happened to be the largest retailer in Ireland, Tesco, at the time anyway. Um, and since then we've now um, rolled out our technology nationally with Tesco, Aldi and Lidl. And uh, for the other retailers that might be missing, we're actually at a trial with them at the moment, but it's not 100% official yet. Um, and then what was amazing about this is we also realised that although food redistribution had been happening since the 60s and the 70s in most developed countries, um, including the establishment of a European network of food banks, a global network of food banks, um, that we had, even though these solutions existed, uh, come at it with quite a unique approach because we decided to start actually with technology. So the solution that we developed um, turned out was uh, under quite a high... Um, was um, valued by other or um, other countries. So the first country now that we've managed to expand into was is the UK, where Fair Share have an existing network of food banks, twenty warehouses that redistribute surplus food uh, in the traditional way using logistics and warehousing. And we've been able to provide them with our technology over the last two years and worked with them to roll it out to all of the Tesco stores and Waitrose stores uh, in the UK. Um, and what it's meant for them is that they've grown their impact at a steady rate over the last 20 years, constantly having to invest in more uh, infrastructure to get to the next stage of impact. But actually providing them with this platform enabled them to increase their impact by 25% in one year. So it really shows the impact that technology can have um, when it's introduced to the non-profit sector and still keeping the traditional way of doing things, but actually using technology alongside that to uh, create a step change in the impact that can be um, had. <clears throat> then in 2016, although we had the technology solution scaled out nationally, we did know that Ireland also needed the, um, the infrastructure to redistribute large quantities of surplus food. So we launched three warehouses, one in Dublin, one in Galway and one in Cork. And now we can redistribute large quantities of surplus food. Uh, from further up the food supply chain. So pallets of one product that one charity couldn't manage, we can store it, break it down and distribute it out to our network charities. <coughs> so our impact to date, um, we have over 3,000 supermarkets across the UK and Ireland that are donating through the platform <coughs> to date. Um, and we've just actually hit 29 million meals uh, have been redistributed through the two solutions. We have 100 food businesses that are now donating through our hubs and um, over 7,000 charities that are benefiting, again, across the UK and Ireland from the solution. 
Um, but I suppose to give one kind of example of a charity that's benefited, Care Social Services um, are one of the first that came on board with us in Ireland. And at the time, 2013, uh, the charity sector in general and care were faced with increased demand for their services and also dramatic funding cuts. Um, so they were in quite a difficult position and they saw this as an opportunity to get um, a free supply of an additional su a resource, essentially, in their community. So they started collecting food from their local supermarkets. They now also collect from our hubs. And actually 20% 20, 20 of their food was collected from local stores, which meant that they were receiving an average value of 3,000 euro per week of food that was being donated. Um, they've now been able to increase the number of people they're working with by 100. And um, actually they've been able to, so when we first met them, they were letting a lot of people, they were making a lot of people redundant because of the funding cuts they were dealing with. They've actually been able to rehire a lot of those people over the last two or three years now. Um, so all in all, it's just been an amazing story. And I suppose for us, this is the impact that we've seen, the growth <coughs> in the number of meals that have been donated. So. Um, I suppose for us and the team, it's amazing to think that that one great story that we've seen happen with CARE is now hopefully happening to thousands of charities across the UK and Ireland, where they're really seeing the value of this uh, resource, which is food, in helping them reduce their costs, invest in other aspects of their services, and actually just bring communities together and people together within their services um, to really see an amazing impact. Um, so we're now redistributing an average of uh, 1.5 million meals every month um, and we're also working on our own other things so we um, being the first organization to redistribute surplus food on a national scale of Ireland we have to work with the Food Safety Authority and um, we're also members of an EU platform on food loss and waste sharing best practice uh, we've worked with the Environmental Protection Agency and I suppose the point of this is just that because we were doing something that was very new to Ireland, it was very important that from the very beginning we engaged with all of the other um, organisations that, that could have an impact on this and actually um, get them to help us move faster and break down a lot of the barriers that we could have faced. So the future. Uh, by 2020, we're aiming to be in 6,000 supermarkets across the UK and Ireland. We talked to double the amount of food businesses that we're working with in Ireland through our hubs um, and reach uh, 38 million meals per year um, that would be redistributed to 12,000 charity partners. And we believe, of course, that technology can help and support to scale our solutions. So one is making it simple to donate in terms of connecting um, more and more supermarkets with their charities in their local communities. And another, actually, which is relatively new, and we started with support of ThinkTech last year, is looking to see how we can use, the technolo use technology to um, increase the impact that we can have further up the food supply chain. So looking at how technology can really support our hubs model so that we can find a way to exponentially increase the impact that we can have there. And then, of course, uh, we'd like to share the technology that we've developed, that we use ourselves in Ireland, that we've licensed into the UK with other um, organisations internationally. And um, we've actually just started working with a food bank in Australia to see if we could license mm -hmm. our technology to them in a much more kind of hands-off uh, model than we have done in the UK. So we thought Australia would be a good test, considering the distance and time zone differences. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a choice but to uh, try a hands-off model. Um, so that's it. I think I've just hit my ten minutes there. Uh, so <laughs> thank you much. very much. <laughs>
and working with um, older people to enable them to live at home and more importantly perhaps to keep them in the community and empower them. But through technology now alone and through the work of Sean and his colleagues, they've enabled uh, through an integrated technology structure to enhance people's quality of life, to enhance their control of their own lives in a way perhaps that in a way that Isol to talked about food, you're talking about people living in a community. And I think there's another aspect to your work, and I, I think you're going to talk about it. Not only are you talking about empowering people living in their home, but empowering agencies, local communities, to work together, not only in a partnership way, but in a collaborative way as well. So, Sean, thank you very much. That's probably a better job than I'll do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I'm off home. <laughs> so, listen, appreciate it, and uh, it's great to be here today. And uh, so, just, I suppose, that's what we do. Alone, we support all the people that age at home. And funny enough is, is um, you know, NGOs are meant to work to, to, to eliminate themselves in some ways. And when I, I came into Alone, they were actually considering winding up. They were down to two staff and around 40 vol vol volunteers. And so I, we, we discussed it for a while and we talked about investment and we do this and do that. Yeah, and Lehman Brothers went bust the next week uh, that was, and all the money that we planned for all disappeared fairly rapidly. But anyway, so that, that we started from the bottom. So I suppose the funny thing about even the cover slide there is putting down logos around quality and trust. NGOs, we work, you know, we work with people and we need the trust of those people. We need the trust of the people who donate to us. We need the trust of the government. But we also know people to know that we're outcome focused. We're there to do a job. We're set up. We, we, we provide housing. We're there to provide more housing. Where we provide technology, we're there to provide more technology. And where we're there to support all the people at home, it's, it's to support as many as possible. And people need to realise that, that we do that to the best of our ability and are willing, willing to be held accountable for it. I suppose. So what are we doing? We have an ageing dem demographic, right? And so ultimately we get around, depending on whose figures you go with uh, and what age you get, but over 65s, we get around 26 to 27,000 extra over 65s every year. We're on a journey from half a million to a million and a half. It's a great thing. People are living longer. We need to celebrate that. But naturally with that type of huge shift, it causes problems. Current systems won't hold, right? And on top of that is the percentage of people end up struggling. And an awful lot of older people live on the basic, 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 uh, the basic pension, the basic income. And that can cause problems, especially as you get less able, less mobile, or maybe you're on your own. Okay? We have fragmented communities. The advent of the internet, the way we work, the way we operate, there's less businesses in our communities, there's less people in the communities. A lot of the informal supports for older people aren't there. I was with one of our services in Donegal there the other day and a woman who just got a befriender for her father-in-law and sa staff support for her father-in-law because her husband was going to Dublin every week to, to work. She had two young children and her father-in-law was 20 minutes away in the car and he was starting to develop dementia. So that's what people are trying to struggle with and cope with and everything else. Is people want to do the right things but we have to enable them to do that. Okay. So the other thing is, is that is a map of places and people we support up and down the country or we operate. But really the thing we is, is models and scale. Everywhere we go, if you go to things, people will talk about um, there's lots of agencies in homelessness, there's lots of agencies in older people's services. But what we need is models so everybody is consistent practice of what we're doing and that these models are scalable. So when you've got something that's going to go from half a million to a million and a half, you really need to have a structure and a model that's going to respond to that rather than a fragmented approach. So a lot of what we do is about the formation of our sector. So what we do on a daily basis, the staff do is, is and uh, we befriend information and supports. Isolation and loneliness, and we're running a small, we're running a task force at the moment with across all the age groups. Loneliness affects younger people as well. Mental health charities uh, cross the political divide to try and get it put as uh, public health issues because it will shorten your life. Right, so your mental and physical health compromise. So we're working on that. But every day, what we do is, is we've gone across the country and by county council area, by county and healthcare area, we calculated the percentage of older people isolated and lonely using Tilda studies, Trinity numbers, etc. And then for coordination and support, we've done the same thing. People need go in, 
work with an individual, empower the older person, what are the blockages to ageing at home, and then we work to eliminate with them by leveraging everything that's in the community and using all the different <coughs> services or different government departments. Because unfortunately, people live in a world you're not all about health, transport, legal problems, physical problems, housing problems. You've all these things that have to be support to people. And the third thing we do is <coughs> housing with support. And again, we're running another campaign at the moment about the housing needs for older people. We want all the families and children to have housing, but in an aging demographic, the numbers behind that, as house ownership falls, we have a very large percentage of older people entering retirement in private rented. And the campaign at the moment is, to, how do you pay the rent when you retire? Now, and unfortunately, if you were in a partnership and somebody passed away, you lose all that emotional support, but you could also lose half your income. So again, how are you going to pay the rent? And there is no plan at the moment, so we're again stimulating debate. We're very much a campaigning organisation, but we try to do it on evidence, practice on people, rather than have it, you know, giving out to people, giving people lists of things to do and telling them you're right and they're wrong really never changed anything. Do you know what I mean? It's all about working. Public service, HSE, all the different departments are full of good people doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. NGOs can help them break out of those silos and break out because we can operate across whole of government and whole of geographical areas. And the third thing we do is Be Connect, which is where our technology sits within that. So when we work out the demand and we work out what we're going to do, we realise, oh my God, this is a huge task. How are we going to resource others? So we provide technology resources and training to other agencies. I'm just going to run, if, if this works, is it? No. Is it? Yeah. This is Brendan, who's running his own digital hub up in Kilbarrick, if the sound works. It's not on. Yeah. It's going to the other organization. Okay. Uh, well, I can skip to her. But I suppose in some ways we'll wait till we get a picture of him before we cut him out. I'll read some of the... And I'll cut, I'll cut it down yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'll move on because it's hard for people. I suppose the, the aim there is, is, is to bring it back to the individual and thousands of Brendan's. Brendan's life journey is in a certain way, but we're using it to help him, even though he's wheelchair bound, to remain living in his own home, right? So our technology, shall we say, around that is what we have is, is we've management information systems. So what we've done is all assessments, purchases, all the management systems you need, governance, is all computerised. So what happens is, is we then know somebody goes in, sees an individual, and then we get a support plan, plan for them. The main thing then is, is we've apps for friends, families, uh, and our staff. So when people are either the volunteers are visiting or family are there, we can get information back on how the person is. The Be Well app is where we provide older people with tablets and they can monitor their own health and they can also monitor their social groups. And we load up things of interest to them, do you know? Um, what you find, and I suppose we're trying to break down the stereotype that older people aren't interested in technology, right? Mm -hmm. The mobile phone's over 20 years old, so, if, you know, if you were 45 when it came out, you're 65 now, yeah. do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's moved on. Plus, what you find is, is people embrace it because it's something new. They know it's something that they haven't really got access to, and they go to it. So, if people come in, can I get the GA results? Can I do this? Can I mm -hmm. do that? But also, you're trying to empower one of the first people who got that tablet, because part of the tracking was is where they're going outside their house, how active where they were. Mm -hmm. And they realised for themselves is, I'm not leaving my house. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not mm -hmm. seeing anybody. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, put support them take on. So then you have the, the, the organisation, the family, the friends, the older person, and then be home is assistive technology in the home. Uh, in the home. So what we now have is, is a platform. Rather than us designing all different types mm -hmm. of software, so somebody comes out with a very, very good app that maybe is around mo monitoring COPD or monitoring something around your blood pressure right now says we can just load it up. So ultimately we can keep going with everybody connected. And the older people own the data. So what's going on, they can forward to friends, family, to us or to their GP. Okay. And, they, and what that then also gives us is e-health. We can pl plug into the e-health and as and uh, there's a proactive, there's a 2020 projects where they're trying to link all the different hospitals and all the medical. Our hope long term is, is that what we have in the community, somebody ends up in an emergency department, all this information will be available. So we, people will know what's going on. Mm. The other thing is, is it gives us all the data of 
what's happening. So I know for the last 1,400 people we worked with between 70 and 90, actually housing issues were the second highest, which mm -hmm. even though a lot of these people own their own houses, mm. you know, uh, and everything else. So you, you start building up the data for planning of what, what's going on and for designing your services. And then if that's our service, then what you do is, is we add that in and give it to other agencies. And the first 10 agencies are already on it, which means now you have 10 agencies go back to models, you have 10 agencies operating to the same standards, to the same quality standards, building up to producing the same data. The other great thing is, is we've also got 10 agencies learning from each other and, and working together and partnering and not competing. And you know, there's one of those agencies we work with and they're, they're based in Dundalk, or sorry, in Drada, and we've, we've sp spots in Drada uh, in Dundalk, as it happens, and, uh, and in Mead. And so what we do is, is everything that comes to us from Dundalk, we now go to them and vice versa. So again, it solves some of the capacity problems of, of, what, of, what, of what you're doing. So in the assistive technology stuff, this is the base package we've started putting into people's homes. And we've uh, piloted with Dublin City Council. They're in, it's in our housing, and we're talking to a good few of the AHBs about it. So what happens is, is you get the B-Well, you, you get the tablet, you've got things like door sensors, presence sensors, monitor and temperature. Temperature is a good one, just using it. So if you imagine, so this is solving social problems and things that, um, that so if you take te temperature, We've just come out of a big cold snap, right? Mm. Excess winter deaths is a dreadful thing. But over 300 people, 300 over 65s every year die in Ireland because of the cold, right? Mm. Because they get pneumonia and get things. And older people tend to live in the older houses. We'll know if the tent heating's on. Mm. Do you know, very simple yeah. prompt. Yeah. It's really cold down, Mary. You wouldn't think of switching the heating on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like things like One that. Calls, so, much, yeah. the, pe the pebble that pendant alarm is the next thing is, is that's a fall sensor. If you fall, if you fall and break your hip and you're over 70, you're 70, seven times more likely to die within a year, mm. right? It's a fall sensor. We'll know how much the impact is. It's got geo-mapping. So if somebody was starting to get a touch of dementia or for forgetfulness, mm. you could put a ring fence around of a half a mile around the house and then get them with their permission. And if they go outside that, go to somebody's mobile phone and you know where the person or the individual is. So we, 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 we can support people to your home. Long term view of that, is, is as I was, we were in Dundalk yesterday at the European eco, Health Ecosystem, mm -hmm. is, is how do we then personalise that? Somebody comes home and they have a prevalence to fall. Somebody else comes home and they've got other issues. We can start putting different technologies in, depending. And if people go back to a baseline, we can switch it off. You know, mm -hmm. like we can switch things on and off, mm -hmm. you know? So that's it, because there's obviously GDPR and we have to we, we, we have to be compliant with all that. Our vision for the next few years, I mentioned 100 agencies on the, one, well, well, on the one platform. For us, it's a journey probably to around 9,000 volunteers. That's 9,000 reimagining the community that has changed, 9,000 people visiting every week, supporting their older people. And then another, the balance of that coming through other agencies that we work with in partnership, like the one I mentioned in Drada. Then what we do is, is That'll be 36,000 people. That will create a network that we can then help scale other agencies. So if you take housing was the second issue. We don't do repairs. Now we get other people to do them. So we will work out the demand and try and get somebody else to scale to do that. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately you're moving into a situation that you're helping your whole sector to respond. Mm -hmm. On the housing with support, huge thing, we're going to be 6,000, lots of stats here, I'm sorry, right? Uh, we're going to be 6,000 nursing home spaces short, C, uh, HSE figures, within by 2022, right? So we need alternative models, Europe. So things like housing with support, and we're looking for private funding on that. We want to produce a private model of where we'll produce housing with support as an alternative to, 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 to nursing home. So as you can see, the impact we're trying to get is the older person, relatives, friends, families, volunteers, other NGOs, and, and, the, state, and the state. So we can bring a huge, where we have a huge change in demographics, that we can actually respond as a unit. It's been government policy, the first book on it in 68, and since 88, there's been a, a tome written about the way forward that older people should, should, should age at home. What we have to do is make that possible because it takes a whole government approach 
And what NGOs can do is, is we can build the infrastructure in the community that all, whether it's transport, whether it's communication, whether all the different departments can actually work with and we can make these types of things possible. Thank you very much, Sean. I think you've shown us a, a vision for the future. Um, and perhaps we can come back to that again. Um, and now we're, we're, as we're going to look with, with um, Brian Fitzsimons. Brian's a very interesting background. He's worked in education and management, but was also a, a um, social entrepreneur himself in that he established Reimagine Cork back in 2014, but then joined um, iSkull. And it is interesting to know the figures, and I think data is important in this. Over 3,000 young people between the ages of 13 and 16 uh, drop out of school um, every year. It's a, it's a big number. It may, it may seem small, but it is a big number. And they drop out for a whole variety of reasons, and they don't you know, get any qualifications, and they're lost to the system. But iSkull have developed a method uh, of encouraging and bringing young people back into the education system using online platforms and working also, of course, with community as well. But the, the key thing there is that they bring people back uh, into learning, accredit them and enable them to progress. And we all know, of all things, education really dictates our life's chances. So I think iSkull is another really extraordinary organisation that has been set up since 2007 and has been working with this cohort of young people, working again in partnership with Tusla, you know, youth groups, the Gardaí and local resource centres. So, Brian, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, iSchool, uh, moving on to how technology helps in the education sector. So um, I think if we all imagine or if we all think of somebody who we know who's an early school leaver, we probably struggle. Uh, but maybe some of you are thinking of this guy, uh, and unfortunately, he's not the norm. Uh, the reality of early school leaving is more so the bottom two images there a higher risk of mental health issues, of being involved in the criminal justice system. And we know, as Joyce said, 3,300 young people leave school every year under the age of 16. And there's significant consequences to that. So for the individual, they're four times more likely to be unemployed. They're six times more likely to be in poverty. And as I mentioned, they're more at risk around drug, alcohol misuse and ill health. The social impact, we know that over 50% of the prison population leave school before the age of 15. So that has significant consequences on the economy not only the prison, place, prison places, uh, but also lost revenue and, of course, impact of that drug alcohol misuse as well. So a little bit about iSchool. So um, like Choi said, we're, a, we're an online learning service or a school. We work with 13 to 16 year olds. Uh, they get referred into our program. They come in very often with uh, behavioral issues as a reason for them not being able to maintain in mainstream with mental health issues or for disaffection. We, we work closely with uh, Education Welfare Service and they are the statutory body that has responsibility for uh, young people being in school under the age of 16. So they refer the young people in. The qualification that the young people can achieve is QQI Level 3, which is the equivalent of their junior cert. And they log in from two iSchool in either one of two locations. So roughly half our students log in from their homes and then the other half log in from blended centres. And in the blended centres, we have partnerships with a range of different agencies and services, a little bit like alone, in different communities around Ireland who host the, the, the centre. Young people come in, attend at set days, and not only do they do the, the iSchool programme in terms of their education, but the informal education around their needs are, are, are responded to by maybe crime prevention programme, counselling, family support. Um, so it's a holistic approach. So there's a, a few snaps from one of our blended centres in Longford. You'll see at the bottom right picture, 
Uh, that's two of the lads working away on high school. And then in the middle, we have a support worker, um, Mark, who's, who's helping them on. So when the students are online, each of them are allocated an individual mentor, and that mentor builds a learning plan for them every single day, and it's updated every day they're online. And behind the mentor is a group of tutors. So for every course iSchool have, we have tutors that design the content, correct the work, give feedback to students. Um, the nice thing about the blended learning model as well is they can use activities that they do in their local youth services and centres to become accredited too. So the two other pictures you're looking at there, there was uh, accreditation for personal effectiveness at QQI Level 3 around a healthy eating project and a football tournament as well. So a little bit more about technology and how we use it. Well, what it does is it enables students to become self-directed. The young people that we work with, they're out of school for at least six months. In many cases, they've had a really negative experience in education in the past. So we start to work with them and ask them to choose the pace that they work at and what do they think will challenge them. We create weekly plans and term goals for each individual student. We're extremely flexible like that. Um, students are coming with a range of issues and we need to be, to be able to respond to them um, as, as much as we can. We offer personalised learning, so um, students can work at their own pace, they can work around content that they're individually interested in as well, and all the time they're online, there's synchronous support. So we're, we're open from Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and there's always a, an adult tutor, mentor, or one of our central team online if they need to ask a question or have a live call. There's example of our live call there with Sean, he's actually one of our uh, student mentors and he's based in Barcelona. Um, so in terms of technology as well, so when we get the referral in from Education Welfare Service, we start to develop a picture and we have a thing called a student profile that we develop. So we get an idea of a student's motivation. We start to get an understanding and a capture on their emotional well-being and, and their strengths and their weaknesses and where they work well and where they don't work well. We have information on their learning environment and how supportive it is, whether it's in a centre or home. We look at their learning needs, so their literacy, numeracy, ICT, and then also we look at their behaviour and how they communicate with others. And we set uh, challenges and goals based on all of that information, and that's how the learning plan is built for these young people every day. So it's very much technology allows us to put young people at the centre of what we do. So you'll see that there's a range of our courses, um, and again, it's not a case of everyone on iSchool has to do, say, the QQI personal effectiveness course. It's the case that the personal effectiveness course can be completed in the theme of animal care, it can be completed in the theme of health and nutrition or sport. So it's very much tapping into the interests of young people. Um, and it really works. Interest-led learning is really powerful for those young people who are out of school um, and, and have had negative experiences in the past. Here's a, a small snapshot of technology on our maths course. So it's very simple, but um, everyone's trying to get to, to complete, in education parlance, the SLOs, the learning outcomes that gets them to achieve the, the QQI accreditation at, at level three. For some students, they can go there quite quickly and they can go through the kind of advanced course. But what technology allows us to do is offer it at a number of different levels. So once we find out what level the student is at, we can pitch the content around where they're at and maybe take them around a longer route, but they'll still get to the same outcome in the end. We offer students multiple modes of submission. So in terms of assessment, it's not just text-based at the bottom. They can uh, record audio if they wish. Uh, they can record video, which is digital media video, one of our students in the middle there, or they can make posters. And all of these will fit the, the QQI portfolio assessment. In terms of data, um, so I mentioned our student profile and how we build learning plans for students. The second phase on, on, in terms of how we deal with data is we, we observe them online and we see where their strengths are and see where their weaknesses are. We see what content they're having trouble with. And like that, the mentor every day is able to build a learning plan based on that particular need and where they're at. And then in terms of level three, and I think probably as an organization, we're only moving towards level three at this stage. It's more of a macro analysis of all our students together. Now, I drew down this chart there a couple of days ago, and it's just a, a list of the number of tasks that students have done online since January of this year. Um, on its own, it doesn't tell us much, but what it allows us to do and the technology at the back end of our program allows us to do is we can break down a student course, for example, and within that course, all the tasks that students are asked to do, and we can see um, 
where there's stumbling blocks, where students are taking a longer time, and we can also break it down into maybe the referral reasons, so young people with anxiety or young people with behavioural reasons or young people in a home setting, and we're able to respond, and when we look at this macro analysis, we're able to improve the programme, redesign the content, and develop it based on that information. So our, our, our vision and aim, we want every young person to have access to an innovative and flexible med model of education. Um, it's quite simple really, we engage young people in learning, it's a very positive program. We look to build their, their confidence and their self-esteem. Uh, we provide accreditation opportunities and we also support progression. So a big part of the program is when the student is online, it's working with them around what their progression goal is. So do they see themselves returning to school, is it a training centre, a youth reach or a different form of education and we work to build up their confidence and to support them to achieve that goal. In terms of our impact, so at the moment we work with 55 to 60 students per year. Um, from the last 10, 11 years that we've been, um, we've been operating, we have 74% progress back to education. So if you're thinking that these young people are coming to us and they're out of school, they're out of mainstream for at least six months, very often one year or two years, yet 74% of them progress on to further education and training, and we have an 82% success rate of them achieving QQI certification. Um, in terms of our demand, uh, we get a lot of requests for service. So at the moment we have resources to partner with 12 blended centres. We get a lot of phone calls in uh, looking for youth services centres, guard the youth diversion projects, resource centres to host iSchool because they're identifying a need in their own community where young people are maybe hanging around, they're clearly out of school. Um, at the moment we're working towards a model of scale. Um, we've worked very closely with ThinkTech and we can show significant economies of scale. So if we're working with 300 students, the impact will mean a 60% cost reduction on how it, the cost for us to be able to host that student and support them. Um, so that's part of our roadmap for scale and technology and our growth plan. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we can only accept less than 50% of, of suitable referrals that we get in. Um, so there's a clear need there. There's clear evidence that it works, but we're very positive about moving in the right direction and Get, gaining funding for sustainability as well. Um, I've spoken a little bit about core aims and objectives. I won't go into too much detail, but I mean, we're really interested in, in informing future practice and policy, um, in research, in being able to design and, and stay with best practice across mm -hmm. education, not only in Ireland, in, in, in education technology, but across Europe and the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, to finish with some stories. So. Uh, from the second from left is a girl called Georgina. She's from Balnacurra, Western. She's a traveller girl. She was the first young person in her family to ever achieve formal accreditation. And that's her parents on the left and then the support workers who are in the centre um, in a school completion programme in the community down in, in Limerick. Um, that's Mark. Uh, he's there with his family again. This is him getting his full award at level three in Mullingar. Mark went on to do a level four in Sheffing and he's now working at one of the local hotels in the area. And these boyos here, uh, the, the two lads on the right, uh, they, they were referred into iSchool and they started and they had a terrible start. They didn't want to engage at all. They weren't showing up to their centre. We found out after a few weeks that they were down in the field looking after their horses. Mm -hmm. So we were suddenly able to design a programme based around horse care. Um, they both started to come in, their attendance improved and they both got their QQI in personal effectiveness or within working within around uh, the theme of horses and horse care. The guy on the left, I've never met him in my life. <laughs> he just jumped into the picture. He, he saw that there was an opportunity. <laughs> he ran upstairs and got a cert he had from the same centre. It's a Guard the Youth Diversion Project in Kings Island in Limerick. Yeah. Good entrepreneur. <laughs> These are our, our lads in, um, in Longford. Uh, so the, the two f uh, men on the, on the sides of the group are the two support workers who, who work with the, the lads every day and then the three lads with the certs got their full awards uh, last year in, in Longford. Um, there's Laura. Uh, you'll see Laura on the left, I think it's about 15 in that picture. She's working on a digital media project. Laura on the right, it's the same Laura. Uh, she came back um, to collect an award with SIFI in the Education Fund there a few months back, and she's now studying in university. And we've a plethora of these stories of young people going on to further education, the difference the program made in their lives, um, how it saved them in a lot of ways. So it's very nice to hear them. That's a young man called Daniel on the left there. Um, and a little bit like Laura, he came back and uh, he 
told his story there a few months back. I don't know if we can, if we've time to play that, do we? Or yes, of course. Yeah, I think if is it if the chain? sound works, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And that's it. It's not working. No. That's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. on our website if anyone would like yeah. to. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another inspirational story of what can be done to transform people's lives using technology in what often would have been thought hopeless cases effectively. You know, so it's, yeah. it's very inspiring. And um, we have to say, you know, why is Owen Ryan here? Well, Owen is the gel behind all the projects uh, from the Social Innovation Fund. In fact, it, is, it was um, Owen who is the entrepreneur, the reimagined Cork. Uh, a, a social entrepreneur himself, um, an engineer by profession, worked in Ireland and Sydney and travelled, but has, was the person who actually set up the tech, think tech, and was, which was the first uh, innovator or accelerator for these projects. So perhaps you t tell us a little bit about that and what the possibilities are maybe for other people here, <coughs> or for groups that are associated with it. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Owen. Right. Um, I might just start with a couple of questions. I mean, we've heard from three amazing organisations that are doing some fantastic things and using technology as that enabler for better social outcomes, but I just find myself asking, well, why aren't we doing it more? Mm. When we look at the amazing technology industry that we have in Dublin, so we've got all of this capital sloshing around and we've got amazing people and amazing um, knowledge and that's working really really well in that innovation space why aren't we doing that for social issues it seems logical that if it's um, just sitting right there pick up the model and, and do more of it to solve our social issues and I think that's the premise behind um, Social Innovation Fund Ireland we're trying to solve that why we're trying to solve um, and provide more supports for the amazing people that have just spoken here. So I might just go back a step and talk a bit about Social Innovation Fund Ireland and then we might finish with ThinkTech, but I just want to ask everyone that question. Um, if we have the parts of that ecosystem, why isn't it coming together a bit more? What can we do more of to support the likes of Sean and Brian and Isles and all the other Brian and Isles that are out there to solve issues with technology um, in a more coherent way and that we fully understand and know that there's a roadmap there to solving social issues a lot quicker. So part of who we are, that's Deirdre Mortel, our CEO in the top right hand corner. Um, we were actually created by the Irish government back in 2013 as a response to the closing down or imminent closing down of two large foundations, one of which was the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Philanthropies and the second one of which uh, Deirdre was the CEO, which was the One Foundation. So where was that capital going to come from? And what the Irish government did was they set up Social Innovation Fund Ireland to do that, to actually support innovation, to solve social issues, and to actually try and access um, corporates and high net, net worth individuals to work in tandem with the government to create um, large investment funds that supported the likes of um, iSchool and Alone. We personally believe that technology can be that key enabler. So it doesn't, it's, it's not the only thing that needs to be present. You obviously need the amazing people as well, but it can accelerate the process. We've all seen it happen um, in the other sector. Why can't we do it in the social sector as well? So how do we actually do that? So what the, what the government did was they looked around internationally and they, they found a model that incentivized corporates, incentivized high net worth individuals to say, work with us. And they created what was called a one-to-one -one match fund. So for every euro that you gave, it was matched one-to-one -one by the government and it created what we call funds. And the funds allowed us to either focus on social issue or focus across multiple issues. In this case, with think tech where technology was at the core of every solution that we went to look for. And then what we do when we receive the money and we create the fund is that we go out and we find those best ideas. So ThinkTech was a first of its kind, tech for good. We didn't actually know what was there. It was very much testing the waters to see, well, are the ideas out there that we can take in-house, that we can provide cash, and we can provide the supports, and I'll speak a bit more about the supports, so that they're accelerating 
that amazing idea that they have, um, scaling it across Ireland and maximizing their impact. We have an amazing opportunity in Ireland, and I've heard this spoken about a number of times, we have this critical mass. It's the perfect test bed for trying out ideas. Some of them might fail, and that's absolutely fine. But some of them that work can scale very quickly across Ireland. And there's amazing opportunities for us to provide exemplar ideas to work all the way across the globe. And I think Food Cloud are a great example of that. Um, Isla spoke about being in the UK and other countries that are of interest as well. So that is our modus operandi. We are looking for those ideas that we can support with cash, with the supports, and also allow to, to facilitate them essentially to scale across Ireland first and foremost, to maximise their impact, but hopefully go on to um, replicating those ideas across the world. So we heard the guys speak about think tech. What is it? Well, it was Ireland's first 1 million euro tech for good fund. The reason that it happened was that Google.org and Google Ireland said, we believe the technology can be an enabler. We believe that it can solve social issues. We, we, social issues. We've, seen it, we've seen it work. We've seen it work in San Francisco. Why isn't it happening in Dublin? You've got this amazing technology industry. Why aren't we doing more of it? So they really led the way and said, right, here's 500,000 euros, guys. And the Irish government said, great, let's create a match fund if we had our first 1 million euro fund. And what it allowed us to do, as I spoke about, was go out and see and test to see if the ideas were there. And the guys to my right here were the proud recipients of 227,000 euros in an award. And that was made up of, like I say, the cash grant, because the technology, you've got to invest in it to make sure that it works. And then the supports was the next piece that we bring. So we're kind of bringing a venture capital approach. It's what we call venture philanthropy. So we don't just give money. We actually give money with performance milestones attached to that money. And how do we ensure that the money goes as far as possible? Well, we, we develop a supports budget. So money is set aside to support Sean to go take time out of the malaise of the day-to-day -day of the alone office and actually think about where do we want to be in 2022. If we've got this amazing technology solution, what can it actually do? You need time and space to do that. We have mentoring supports. We had an accelerator over six months where we all came together every month and we worked across multiple different um, fields such as pitching and, um, and growth support and organizational support, all with the same goal of trying to set these guys up for when they leave the accelerator, their accelerating scale to Ireland and beyond. So look, that, all that writing is, is probably a bit too small to, to, to see, but essentially it, it, what, I, what we're trying to articulate there is these guys spent 2017 building technology, and they, sent, they spent 2017 actually taking a step back and thinking about their organization, what they needed to change, and how they could use the technology as facilitative transformation. And already in 2017, um, Iselton and Sean touched on the fact that they've, even, they've been able to accelerate their impact. So previously they were doing X, X 100,000 meals a month, it's now, that's now gone well up in, in number. Sean spoke about um, 1.5 million people, I think in the next, by 2022, there's gonna be over 100,000 people that will be suitable for assistive technologies. Mm -hmm. You guys are aiming to, to actually be to facilitate for a third of that, I mean, that's huge. That means that these people are actually empowered and home. They don't feel as lonely, they feel that, that they can actually take ownership of their lives and they're not calling the GP or going straight into hospital. There's massive impact there. Mm. So supporting them to, to actually understand what that is and actually look ahead to the five years. But the next challenge is, well, where do they go from, from here? So how do we support these organizations and other organizations that are out there to take the next step? Because as I said, a vibrant ecosystem takes three things. It takes that capital, it takes the people, it takes the knowledge. At the moment, things are happening around the edges but it's not interconnected and these guys need support to move it on to the next stage because what they have achieved in such a short period of time is absolutely amazing what they could achieve is is is, is mind-boggling but we have to take that brave step in order to do it so what we believe is that think tech was it proved the pipeline and i believe it proved the model so why don't we do more of it mm. we need the capital so the model is there the capital we need the next google to step up and say do you know what there's, there's three amazing organizations here. We want to support them. We want to take ThinkTech out of Dublin. We want to go down to Cork. We want to go to Galway, wherever. We want to be able to stand up in 2020, 2020, our own vision, to be able to stand up in 
on the West Coast and, and invite all the global leaders and be able to say, here's what we did in three and four years. Here are the exemplars that are using technology to enable social change. Come to us. Ireland can be that world-class um, system, ecosystem that supports um, um, the facilitation of, this, of social issues and technology. But it needs everyone. So the match fund is there. The government have kind of dangled the carrot. It needs the multinationals. It needs the corporates. It needs high net worth individuals to be able to say, we're going to come on the journey with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope that kind of facilitates hopefully some of the questions and answers that we have. But they were, they were fantastic organizations to work with. They've done amazing work. They're going to do more. Everyone should jump on the train. Thanks very much.